Good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in and joining us as we continue to live broadcast our tribute to Leon Fleischer. Today, tomorrow and Wednesday, we go live again at 1 p.m. New York time to honor a legendary pianist, musician, teacher, mentor, friend, a man who did and meant a world to a lot of people and to music of our time. This tribute is made possible by an extraordinary solidarity effort of Mr. Fleischer's students who put their love and their work together in honor of their noble teacher. They bring their musical offering. They speak about their mentor. They help us all pay homage to this incredible man. They help us pledge our own dedication to carry on his legacy of the human and artistic values which he taught and upheld himself. We appreciate your patience if the artists may experience challenges with connecting. We will do our best to bring the beauty of each presentation to you in its fullest. And now I would like to welcome to our virtual studio on stage, Alon Goldstein. Alon, so great to have you join us today. And um, this is great, such an honor and pleasure to have you. And as we were preparing to start our broadcast, I heard uh, something which I think portrayed Mr. Flasher's sense of humor. And uh, like his uh, youngest son mentioned, that was a saving element of his approach to life. I heard that all you need to start speaking is an upbeat. So I'm going to give you an upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess it, it shows Mr. Fleischer's sense of humor, but also my sense of talking sometimes. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Anna, for having me, and thank you for doing such a truly meaningful and unique and special tribute to someone that that connected so many of us and inspired so many of us, and it's it's wonderful to share with with, with you and the audience and everyone. And uh, um, Mr. Fleischer was um, mentoring, of course, so that everybody in um, approach to the music, but also I heard from many of his students that a very important part of his mentoring was the um, values and approaches to life. And I understand you had experienced that firsthand. You um, dive into unusual projects and um, Mr. Fleischer was your supporter. Can you? Maybe speak about that a little bit. Um, I mean, in terms of Mr. Fleischer, if I can share a little bit about, you know, his teaching perhaps. And, and uh, you know, I remember being at Tanglewood when he was the artistic uh, director and him approaching all of the students and said that, uh, I hope your experience here will be an everlasting increase of awareness. And I thought to myself, well, well, let me go and <laughs> check in the dictionary some of these words. But being with him, studying with him, listening to him was a, an increase of awareness uh, of, of your relationship to music, what makes music happen, the miracle of music, which happens in the dimension of time. And his questions to us were always the questions that we should ask ourselves starting by, you know, after we played for him a piece, the first question would be, what did you think about your playing? And he wanted you to be very specific. In other words, while you're playing, you have to really be very um, acute, very uh, tuned in to what comes out and ask yourself questions while you're playing, right at the finish line, when you finish the piece. And, and it's like a constant internal dialogue between you and the piece. And then he would give you lots of tools, what to listen for, what to ask. He wouldn't necessarily give you the answers. It was the questions. And he would always say, I will teach you to teach yourself. And um, so these are a little bit uh, of, of him as a teacher. I have a lot of you know, personal you know, memories to share and, uh, and you know, guide teach, me. Teach you to teach yourself. That, that really sounds very profound at the same time it sounds very practical C can you maybe um share some memories of um how you understood this and some interactions with mr fleischer 
um, teaching to teach yourself, my first lessons with him was on uh, the Les Adieux Sonata by uh, Beethoven, Opus 81A, which we all know starts with the uh, one, five, six, you know, tonic, dominant, and then a six, like a deceptive uh, cadence and then a surprising resolution. And, and I remember him, you know, to tell me, I mean, I remember him telling me that, you know, for the next week, would you please just, just do it the way it should have been, you know, the tonic dominant to tonic. And he said, one of the ways to have creative practice, uh, creative learning is to rewrite the music, see what the other options that the composer had. We obviously have this incredible blueprint. We have, you know, the final choice of the composer. But I think a, a wonderful approach to music, which, which Fleischer uh, was nurturing us, is, is to create sketches of the music, create the other possibilities that the composer had before he chose that last possibility. And that can be, in, in so many ways, you know, the beginning of, of a appassionata, which we all know the sonata starts with the tonic going to dominant, then the Neapolitan, which is shocking. But don't put the Neapolitan, put the dominant going back to tonic. Create another phrase, create what should have been by any other lesser composer. And then when you play what Beethoven actually chose, you have a much greater sense of surprise because you know, you, you come from, from other angles. That's like one thing which I thought was like, wow, that's really great. And there are so many possibilities of, of rewriting the music and you start to own the music much more. That is so true. And that also goes along with um, some other students um, bringing up the fact that Mr. Fleischer never stopped wondering uh, about what the composer meant. So that is uh, opening um, behind the scene path to discovering how the composer chose what he chose. Because probably Beethoven um, wondered about that change of the harmony himself and tried many other ways, like you said, which would be more cookie cutter done by uh, lesser composers. And we, we, we've, we've seen so many facsimiles of Beethoven with changes and markings and erasing. and. Exactly. and wonderful what what was he not happy with can we try them and can we create it for ourselves it's just a, it's a very creative way of practicing you know that's that would be one thing then of course he would talk about our relationship you know to the key you know he believed very much in, in the, the finger should be an extension of the key and so rather than play with curved fingers like this it's you know having a flatter finger as if you're an extension now he would be quick to point at the end of the day what comes out of the piano is what's important. You want to play like this, play like that. You want to play like this. But he just believed there's something very natural when you you touch more of the key. He would also, you know, kind of jokingly said, you know, say, I love you like that, right? <laughs> so uh, so caress wonderful. caressing the key, having more of a more of a, a touch with the key. You know, a loving love. relationship with the key. <laughs> exactly, an extension. And, it's and a bit of a tiger. Playing from, you know, playing with your arms, being very loose, being all the time aware, you know, how, how are you going to start the note, perhaps have a certain movement before you start the note. I mean, I think all of us heard this analogy he did when, when you play golf, you know, the, the, the golf ball is here. You never hit the ball. You have a movement before you touch the ball and then a movement to follow. And he always said, you know, when you press the key, it should be the same thing. You don't just press it. You have to have a movement before you press the key and a movement that follows after you press the key. So you have a much greater control and, in, in, you know, overall shape to what you're doing, how you're going to start the note, how you're going to support the note. When you have long notes, you know, they make a diminuendo. But it's your your goal, your your job is to continue to support it, to, to you know, prolong the note. And then how you end the note, do you want it to end like that? You want it to end like that. Don't let the foot control the end of the note. That's many right. Just leave the pedal and then it lift off. The, I mean, but as you can see, it's all awareness, 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 and constantly, you know, asking you, giving you tools that you have to communicate with the music. I mean, and That's you know, incredible. Yeah. For every pianist, and um, there's a, a lot of us pianists um, tuning in and watching this program. This is an incredible call for being aware and for being really involved in everything we do with the piano. Um, would you like us to 
um, move to your um, presentation of um, the musical offering, and then maybe we come back and chat a little bit more? Uh, okay uh, yeah, of course, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I'm actually now in Vienna, very happy that I could go into Vienna, but uh, unfortunately, so I'm not at home and the access to the equipment to record is, is uh, non-existent, but I did want to contribute something I think it's truly truly special to be a part of of uh, what you have created Anna so I thought um, of of presenting a Schubert impromptu which um, I don't recall exactly the lesson that I had on this piece many years ago but you know just just thinking of of this impromptu makes so many uh, truths of Fleischer or as Fleischer would relate to his sainted teacher, Arthur Schnabel, you know, this, this is the famous impromptu opus 90 number two with the, you know, so-called melody, uh, scale-like melody. Uh, I, can, I can hear Fleischer immediately saying, you know, my sainted teacher would say, this is slow music played fast. And, you know, one of these kind of uh, beautiful enlightening uh, comments. So this is the second impromptu by Schubert from the, Opus 90. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alon. This is beautiful recording. Uh, when did you make it? Uh, <laughs> a oh week my ago. <laughs> no, I was supposed to. I knew that I'm going to Vienna, and there was a there is a, a very nice organization in Ecuador. It's called the Casa de la Musica. They asked me to have a recital program for them. So I had a, I made a program with Scarlatti sonatas and Schubert impromptus and some waltzes by Chopin and scherzo by Chopin and and I knew that I would be in Vienna, so I just recorded it from my house, sent it to them, went to Vienna, and it's amazing how this world changed. And uh, you it's know, really what, an impromptu <laughs> recording. Well, I want to let our our viewers know that we tried very hard to bring the second. Um, impromptu, uh, which uh, Alan recorded as well and wanted to have in this program. And uh, we failed you, Alan. We couldn't no. bring the quality which would really truly represent your gorgeous playing. But, but I heard, so I this, heard. Is, this is to be continued. I'd like Absolutely. to invite everyone to um, listen and watch uh, when this is uh, available for public. When are you going to make it available? Uh, I haven't thought about that, but probably soon. After they show it in the concert. That would be wonderful. Uh, yeah. And uh, if you'd like to share some other memories, um, something you want to pass on to um, yeah. the musicians watching, please. A couple of um, maybe un unusual memories that might not be the first thing that jump uh, when thinking about the you know, about Leon Fleischer and my last, very last lessons with, with him were on the third piano concerto by Rachmaninoff. And even though we know that there is a phenomenal recording of the Rachmaninoff Paganini Rhapsody, we seem to, you know, associate him, of course, with, with uh, you know, Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and Schumann and Brahms. Uh, his lesson on Rachmaninoff music or, or of course Liszt or Ravel were just extraordinary. So it was like Rachmaninoff third piano concerto. I don't think there's a recording of him. I don't know even even if he performed it. But it was very interesting because it was one of those occasions where it might have been the end of the year. Most of the students were occupied. I was by myself, and I felt as if he's looking around the room to see that no one is watching. And then he went to the other piano and literally by memory just started to play the whole first movement of the Rachmaninoff Third Concerto. Mind boggling. It was absolutely incredible. I I was stunned, incredible, stunned. Of course, the playing is extraordinary. I was, did you play the piece? But obviously he didn't only play it, he was uh, mastering it completely. So that was like one of, really my uh, you know, favorite memories or lessons with him. There was a, a very funny memory. Uh, I was playing with him in Paris, uh, Mozart, an early piano concerto, the K413 in F major, number 11. And he wasn't as familiar with the piece as with other of the more well-known Mozart concerti. And uh, one of the incredible joys when you played with him is if you took a little bit more time or you did a slightly exaggerated crescendo, he understood where it came from. So there was one place that I exaggerated a certain timing and he looked at me kind of smiling, you know, knowing who, who to blame for that extra time. And because of that, the second violins forgot to get in, to come in. And, and there was a little bit of a mess that was in rehearsal. So. You know, everything was fine. We finished the rehearsal. Before the concert began, he looked at me and he said, you know, Alon, if something happened and the second violins don't come in or we end up not finishing together the piece, let's just make sure we meet on the coffee place at the corner of the street. <laughs> so at least we have a meeting place at the end of the piece. I thought that was kind of quite funny. What a sweet memory. Thank you so much for sharing this. And um, it was just a great honor and great pleasure to have you with us. And we're looking forward to more meetings and hearing more of your performances. This um, this is wonderful. Thank you for such a wonderful, warm offering for uh, Mr. Flasher.
Thank you, Anna. And it's a, it's it's my honor. It's our honor. And thank you to you and to the team. It's it's really something truly unique and special. And and we are so thrilled that you made it and that we can share. So thank you and and God bless and stay safe. Please do stay safe yourself too. Okay. And we'll say goodbye to Alan Goldstein. And before we move into our, our welcome, our next participant, um, another student of Mr. Fleischer, um, I would like to um, just mention that um, today, um, I think it's appropriate to what we just talked with Alan. Um, it brings me to one of the quotes I read this morning in the article, which uh, in a phallix published. Um, it was published by uh, LA Times. And um, she said something which uh, struck a very um, deep note in my own feelings about Mr. Fleischer. Um, and I, here I quote Ina Felix, music was more important than us and our individual problems, he taught us. And we were lucky to commune with it. They were not easy concepts to grasp immediately they would take time and living. And now we will be um, inviting our next um, participant in the tribute to Mr. Fleischer. Please welcome on our virtual stage, Peter Takash. And um, it's so great to have you, Peter, with us. And again, this is just a blessing that you were able to join. Uh, we are putting it together in such a quick on the fly. Hello, Anna. Again. So many thanks to you for putting all this together. It's really remarkable. Thank you. And would you like me to um, leave the stage for you so that you can just present and interrupt it? Maybe a little bit. Why don't you stay with me? You have such a calming presence. Oh, thank you. <laughs> of course, I'll stay. Uh, I was going to say a few. Uh, you know, we, we all have so many m cherished memories. Um, and, you know, sometimes I get quite emotional. But I want to share a couple of things that I think to me almost speak of destiny. Because I came to the US from Romania in 1962. And I was a young pianist. And when I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when I walked into a record store. And for some reason, I had $1 in my pocket. And they said, uh, I said, do you have a record I could get for $1? And they showed me this one. Oh my goodness, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, I, I have to stop you for a second. I'm going to fall off my chair. This is the first album of Leon Fleischer I ever purchased in the Soviet Union. And I bu bought it in the thrift shop, which was selling um, the records, unwanted records. And I loved the thrift shop. I frequented it. I was a student. I was a young student right. and I had uh, I didn't have a dollar in my pocket. I had only change. Uh -huh. Unbelievable that you would bring it. I still have it. It's incredible. And this is the original one. Oh, my gosh. I, of course, I cherish it. You know, it's got the nice cigarette and the whole thing. But, uh, you know, in a way, that was 1962, and I ended up studying with him in 1969. So it was a, f a foreboding of things to come. And, um, you know, a couple of things I want to say before I play... Um, one of them is to remember his, his left paw, P-A-W, uh, when he was playing on top of the keyboard. And it was the most incredibly gorgeous sound that he got with his left hand. He had this brawny, heavy left hands. And I still remember when he demonstrated the Schumann Concerto theme with his left hand. It won't sound like him, but it was... Uh, <laughs> Oh, unbelievable. We all yeah, wish to play part. like that with both hands. <laughs> exactly, right. Uh, so I remember the left paw is really special. And um, I think maybe the first piece I played for him was uh, Mozart Concerto K503, which he recorded with uh, George South. And uh, we got to a certain spot, and I was kind of young, and I was a little bit uh, brash. So I said, you know, I think maybe this could go a different way. And he said, you know, there are many ways that music can go. 
But about this concerto, I feel rather proprietary. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, you, you win, so, you know, sense of humor and so on. I don't know if you know the story about when he and George Zell couldn't rehearse at a piano because it was being tuned. So they were in the backstage room, and there was no piano, so Fleischer started playing on the table to just show him what was going on. And, and George Zell said, you know, I really think you could bring out your top voice a little bit more. <laughs> And Sasha said, yeah, I know, Maestro, but, I, you know, I've never played this table before. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. So he was a very, very funny man. So, And one last thing, and then I will play something, um, his way with words. You know, the beginning of the fourth concerto, he said, you should feel like you're sinking into a bath of G major. Oh, wow. Just kind of, you know. It's so beautiful, you know, just kind of like, ah, that kind of thing. So that is exactly the feeling. I'm going to carry you know, that on just for kind of yeah. sinking into this incredible sonority with uh, eight notes in warmth and the, yeah, and comforting. Yeah, just open the door to the heaven, actually. Yeah, it is beautiful. Would you like to play for us? Um, I would like to play a piece I did not study with Leon, but it's meaningful to me, and it's uh, you know a tribute to him. It's the Chopin Nocturne in E Major, Opus 62, Number Two.
I don't even want to interrupt that last uh, resonating note of um, this beautiful playing. Peter, thank you so much from the deepest of my heart. This was an incredible experience to listen to your interpretation of this nocturne. Beautiful. This and is a late nocturne, of course. Yes. Uh, one second. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that Chopin loved was the cello. So playing something like... Uh, It is incredible. And one of the students on our um, group chat on Messenger, we have almost 100 people joining um, this uh, group chat, people sharing the copies of the music they have and other memories and jokes, which they didn't want to bring to the broadcast, <laughs> but which uh, they heard from Mr. Fleischer over years. Uh, one of his students shared the um, page of um, uh, a piece where it says in very bold writing in Mr. Fleischer's handwriting, Espressiva. And it, it is for the tenor voice, uh, actually. Of course. Well, of I know that Yael played the Chopin etude for the, the so-called cello etude, so I can imagine. Um, It's heavenly. Cello is a heavenly instrument. That's um, incredible. Um, and Peter, if you have um, any other memories you would like to share with us and um, pass on to everyone who is watching. And it's not only Mr. Fleischer's students who are watching. Uh, new generations of upcoming musicians and pianists are also tuned in and watching. Well, you know, one of the things that I think we all feel is now that uh, Mr. Fleischer is gone, we feel a new sense of responsibility. Carry on what he told us. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. Me too. Um, <laughs> and so it's, you know, very inspiring to feel like you can pass on the wisdom. Uh, so I think that's all I can say right now. We'll pledge to carry on the wisdom because that is a, um, a guiding wisdom for us as musicians and as people. The incredible influence he had on hundreds and hundreds of aspiring artists. And, uh, you know, I think in some ways, I mean, I don't know if I should say this, but I think in many ways he's as powerful an influence as Schnabel was on his, on his generation. So he certainly had more students than Schnabel did. Yeah, right, right. M much more. <laughs> And, um, just, you know, we all consider ourselves, I'm sure you've heard this many times, incredibly lucky to have been in his presence. Of course. And as a person, too, the way he approached and overcame his own challenges with this uh, never-ending movement forward. Um, Absolutely. And I also, you know, would like to say that um, he was never a cruel teacher. He was always humane. I mean, sometimes stern, but uh, there was never a sense of, of uh, trying to humiliate or to shame the student. It was always like a collaboration. So that was very important. It's incredibly important, and uh, this is what I hear from everybody who uh, participated. The humility, the humanity, the joy, the dedication are the, the hallmarks of his teaching, uh, both in, mu in musical and in personal teaching. Thank you so much for sharing, for being with us, and uh, for being so generous with your memories and with your music. Absolutely, Anna, thank you. And uh, I'm sorry I got a little emotional there, but you know, it's very sincere. I don't think you need to be sorry about it. I have tears rolling down. I hope nobody can see them. <laughs> right, right. Thank you so much, and thank you for doing this. It's just uh, really fantastic. Thank you. And uh, with this, uh, we will be um, saying goodbye to our viewers, to our listeners, and to the students of Leon Fleischer for today only. We will be back tomorrow again at 1 p.m. Please tune in for more. And on Wednesday at the same time at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, New York time. And we will have more people joining us and bringing their gorgeous music 
and their wonderful memories and their pledges to carry on this enormous and incredible legacy of Mr. Flasher. Goodbye. Thank you.